So today we're continuing with plate tectonics and earthquakes. Get in here. And we're going to use the West Coast as, as a bit of a model because that's where most of the earthquakes are. Besides, you're going to graduate from BU someday, and a lot of you are going out west to Seattle, to San Francisco, to LA, or to San Diego. And look out, you're flying into dangerous land. Or maybe it's Manila, or Singapore, Beijing, Japan. I am here to keep you out of harm's way, even when you go there. <coughs> Earthquakes. Next week, volcanoes. I've already told you that the Earth has, as it's done so often in the past, super volcanic eruptions. The planet is affected in a way that is almost not imaginable. And our, some of our, our greatest extinction that happened in the Permian Triassic boundary it was caused by volcanoes. And I told you the next time Mount Rainier goes in the way that it really can, our Yellowstone, North America, will not be the same. The thing is about earthquakes is that the really big eruptions are very infrequent. They can be dormant for 100 or 200 years and not even have the really big one. That may wait a thousand. So go out west. But, as we'll see today, earthquakes are more common. <coughs> Earthquake faults are often dormant. But when they reawaken, it's on a scale of not thousands, but 100 or 200 years. And then they let go into 100 years of strain that accumulates 6 centimeters in a year. 6 centimeters in a year, <coughs> and I'm letting it fill year after year after year after year. You have an earthquake, but it's not enough. I gotta move all that. I mean, I need to move that in a year, and I waited that Sorry, year, I waited I 10 years. You there you go. <laughs> and I waited 20 years. You have something move like this. It's a big earthquake. And there's no warning. Volcanoes warn you. The lava breaks its way to the surface. You have time to evacuate. You hear it rumbling. And you can watch and track the lava as it gets closer to the surface. Get out of here! And you go. So watch this. This was the 8.9 March 11, 2011 earthquake in Japan. Wait. Oh, uh, which one is it? Screen left, <coughs> off, screen right, off, off. That better? Watch this. This is amazing. All right, we're going to start. This thing's been depressed. Earthquake waves you cannot hear. <coughs> Primary, secondary waves. But they're waves. You can mathematically take them and compress them to where they're at the wavelength of sound. It's called sonar, sonification. And this was the movie that I could not play for you. This PowerPoint from last time is now on Blackboard. You should be able to see it. But watch this. Okay, there it goes. It's quiet. No precursors. It's quiet. Four different stations. It's quiet. 8.9 earthquake, about that. Wow. Wow. You just felt an earthquake. <laughs> wow. Now the aftershocks. Look at the light up, up and down the coastline. Look at that. Boom. Not every station hitting every one. They're happening in different places. Old things rocking. All right, here comes a pretty good one. All three stations can pick it up. Boom! Wow! All right. So, no more. Not as damaging as a huge super volcanic eruption, but it's going to happen. And as we'll learn today, the West Coast has been very quiet. Seattle, Portland has been quiet since the year 1700. The last time he went in San Francisco was 1906. The last time he went in LA was 1857. A lot of you are going out west, far other parts of the world. You need to be prepared. When I was in LA in Del August, I had an earthquake emergency backpack in my car, everywhere I went. With food and water and first aid. Why? Because the freeway's gonna be gone. And I can hike, I can walk to get my children. 
Put your 12 miles away. And you get as well. Crazy. So this was a super earthquake, obviously. Well, all right, now they go away. Let's see if this thing works. Where am I? Okay. Reset all slides. I'll do that. We're doing that to get those clickers out. Uh, channel 41. Several people are new. People are still adding this class. Wonderful. Uh, you go into, how do you register your clicker on Blackboard? How do you do it? <coughs> uh, go to tools. And have the registration. And then you put in the number on the back. Okay. All right. So everybody can do that. That's great. This is part of our learner center. <coughs> okay, I reset all slides. Response devices, automatic. Let's see what this looks like. I never know. Ooh. Plate tectonics, one. Island arcs result from the convergence of two ocean plates. Now I've now opened the poles. Fire away! Is that right? Island arcs. What are island arcs? Why are they arcuate? The Aleutians, Japan, the Philippines, why are the Marianas, why are they arcuate? Okay, and you have fired away. Now I'll open the poles to close it down. You have just seven more seconds to make up your mind. You can change your mind. <coughs> All right, active learning. That is us. And now, 128 of you fired away. 85% said true. The correct answer is true. Now, if you're in that 15%, don't feel bad, but imprint the right answer. Okay, question there. What about hotspots? Yeah, good. Hotspot islands, I'm glad you asked. Hotspot islands like Bermuda, the Canary Islands, Hawaii, are not in an arc. They're created by hotspots. They do not have a trench. Right? <coughs> they, their earthquakes are solely volcanic in origin and not tectonic. I'm really glad you asked that. So there's a difference between Hawaii and the Aleutians, and you, you got it right on. I like being stopped, and I love getting questions. All right? Let's do another one. This is good. Take a picture of these if you want to. Subduction zone earthquakes range in depth from shallow at the trench. She's doing it. <laughs> to several hundred kilometers beneath the overriding plate. Now, now, right now, I have opened the poles. Fire away. You have just a few more seconds. I'll start the countdown about right now. I find if I start it too soon, it closes, because it takes a while for all the hits to come in. So I know you're in class. I know what you've said. Is this for a grade? No, except for the fact you're participating. All right, way to go. And you said, 86% of you said truth. The correct answer is true, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> earthquakes associated with divergent plate boundaries are all shallow. Earthquakes associated with transform faults are all shallow, and they're not as abundant. But earthquakes associated with subduction zones are really abundant. That's where most of the earthquakes are. <laughs> And they start shallow at the trench, and they follow the inclined subduction zone. And they go down <coughs> several hundred kilometers, okay? Far more earthquakes, far more scary, all right? Would you rather live in San Francisco or Fairbanks, Alaska? <laughs> all right. Ocean crust is youngest at ocean ridges, where it is formed and, progressive, and becomes progressively older with distance from the ridge. Poles are now open. Fire away. Why do you think? You are in a safe zone here. No penalty. Get it right or wrong doesn't matter, but you're going to see the right answer. And now, I start the countdown, so finish up. Good. And as you know, Ocean Cross is everywhere, young or old. Well... And you said, it is true, the ocean crust everywhere, Denise, in the back of the room, <coughs> ocean crust versus continental crust, which is really old? No. <laughs> and that's why, and you know, my call, and I'm going to start learning more and more names. 
When I call on you, I don't necessarily expect the right answer. All right? I'm engaging you. And you think, oh, God, you're going to call on me. I better start thinking. We get those thinking wheels going. Continents are really old. They have young rocks on them, but that's where our oldest rocks are. The really, thing about ocean crust, it's everywhere very young. And it's symmetrical with the young, old, youngest crust forming today at the mid-ocean ridges and the occasional hot spot on it. All right? And then it symmetrically gets older, but that only out as far as 220 million years, not 4.0 billion like continents. So what happened to the old ocean crust? Oceans have been here forever. Where is all the ocean crust? Who can tell me? Huh? Yeah, it got subducted down at, to the core mantle boundary. All right? I don't want to die in the oceans. Remember that? <coughs> Help me. Mommy, this teacher really scares me. The longest mountain range of the earth is mostly underwater. Okay, poles are open. The longest mountain range of the earth is mostly underwater. Would I try to trick you? Look at this face. Can you trust this one? I don't know. <laughs> okay, nine more seconds. Finish up. Real exam questions all the time. Will I use some of these? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And you said, 75% said true. And guess what? Correct answer. Well, I'm talking about the mid-ocean ridges. It is a mountain belt. In and out of every ocean like a seam on a baseball. Stands 10,000 feet high. Is that a mountain? Yeah. Okay. With what at the top? A, a rift valley. Yeah, a rift valley. Okay, we're getting there. And transform faults connect the ends of offset ridges. Open the poles, is that right? Three kinds of plate boundaries, divergent, convergent, and transform. Transform faults, we'll do more about transform today. And I will scare you today. Some of you may cry. <laughs> I just practiced my lecture. And one thing I show, I'm showing, make me cry. Yeah, that's, I'm serious. I'm a guy, too. <laughs> Guys cry? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, to countdown. The few of you still finishing up. You got five more seconds. Transform faults. This is complicated, huh? What do they do? And the correct answer. But first you, 66% said true. You're doing really well here. You know, majority of you are getting the right answer. There it is, true. Uh, 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 the transform faults because of unequal rates of sea force spread. And I'll explain more of this in a moment. Uh, they get offset and that's a transform fault. The San Andreas fault is a transform fault. Both the Red Sea and the Gulf of California are the recent result of rifting and seafloor spreading. Okay, I've opened the poles. You're a little more uncomfortable with this one. I barely touched on it. We talked more about the Red Sea. We'll see a lot, a bit more about the Gulf of California today. The Gulf of California separates Mexico from Baja California. So go ahead, fire away. There's your countdown. Off we go. Seven, six. I got just five more seconds to make up your mind. Change your mind. Ask your neighbor, hey, what do you think? I don't know. 88% said true. Gosh, is that correct? Yeah, way to go. <coughs> Rifting of Gondwana land. Poles are open. Result in the formation of Laurasia and Pangaea. Would I try to trick you? Look at this face. All right, countdown. Rifting on Gondwana land result in the formation of Laurasia and Pangaea. Hmm. Hmm. Which way was it? Okay, polls are closed. 124 responded. <laughs> okay, 58% of you got it right. <laughs> what was the initial supercontinent? Pangaea. I did try to trick you. I did try to trick you in the nicest way possible. Okay? I mean, if everything's going to be true, what good is that? So there's a false one. 
The present site of the Ural Mountains represents the demise of a long lost ocean. And I can rewrite that. Anytime you find an interior mountain belt within a continent, does that mean that an ocean once there will disappear? Okay, what do you think? Okay, you can answer now. Polls are open. Fire away. Countdown to go. Remember how you watched India move northwards like a skateboard out of control, picking up small continents, small continents, small continents, crashing into the bet. 79% of you said true. And that is the right answer. Now, if you're still over here, you've got a whole lot of other people catching on, and you may want to start reviewing. You know, I found when I was in college, and I've recommended this often, to review the lectures. Review the lectures before the next lecture. Okay? Review lecture one before you go to lecture two. Review lecture one and two before you go to three. Review lecture one, two, and three before you go to four. And after doing that, and you can do it over coffee. You can do it with friends, all right? And, and in a comfortable environment. But you, by the time you're at lecture nine, you've seen one, two, three, four, a lot. And you're really comfortable with it. You've imprinted all of that, okay? I will be putting these videos up once I can figure it out. Okay, and we also now are getting video from that camera, uh, and it's not very good. It just has this image and my voice. Mostly, I'm disappeared from it, uh, so I really like this one. But we'll have that out for you too, and you can sit there and listen and watch if that helps you. And I want that to be the case. Okay, all right. La la, there we go. Quit. Don't save the clickers. No. Don't save that either. But save the session that has all the data, who was here, and how you answered, and all that stuff. Got it. That's where it goes in my computer. Bye. 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 Don't go there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. I lost everything. Ah! That's where we are, and we're looking at the aftermath of a 2004 earthquake in Japan, uh, featured by National Geographic. All right, so let's go there. You're learning in lab this week. Now, some of you have already missed a lab because you got ill, and but a lot of you are new. What's our policy if you miss a lab? Go to another one, and you send one email to both your TA, TF, and to the one who's teaching lab you want to go to. All right. Communication. You could get to those labs. Right? And, and so you're learning about earthquakes. And earthquakes come in multiple ways. When the earth breaks, the earth, it's remarkable. The waves move out of a common circle in a, in a sphere. But there's several kinds of waves. The first wave that comes out really fast, there it goes. It's called the P wave or primary wave. It's coming out the fastest, six kilometers per second. That's fast. All right? Boom. And then a separate kind of wave, it's the rolling motion, goes out slower. It's the secondary or S wave. And because it goes out slower, it comes out at a separate time. Unless the earthquake is right underneath your house. If the earthquake is close to you, they're compressed. You just hear, boom! It's like a truck hits your building. You go, wow, and you feel that? Uh-huh. <laughs> that was close, I know. My wife and I are both geology professors. <laughs> You can imagine our pillow talk. When you feel an earthquake, did you feel that? Did you feel that? Which part? <laughs> but, 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 when we feel it once, and then the, we feel them separated, the T wave and then the S wave, I go, honey, what? There were two of them, I know. <laughs> then, then you know, when you feel them separated and you still felt it, you go, God, that was a big one. And it was really far away. All right? Wow. So you know something kind of awful might have happened. 
That's how that works. So that means you can use a PNS wave difference in time like lightning and thunder. <coughs> Which comes in first? Light travels faster or sound? Lightning. Oh, yeah, you know that. So when the P and S, you measure the difference in time, that tells you how far away it is. But you don't know where it is. But you know the distance of what? So you can draw a radius around you all the way around. Somewhere, an infinite number of places. Okay? But you measure that distance from a, a two more stations, and you get the actual point. Watch this. Whoa, wait, wait. So the P wave is like hitting a baseball. Smack. Hitting a golf ball. Smack. It's a, it's a compression wave. That's why it goes so fast, OK? Cut pow. But the S wave is like a slinky or a rope. So it moves out slower. So that's why there are two different kinds of waves here. And then after that, after the P and S wave, there are complex surface waves that actually do most of the damage. The ground just keeps shaking and shaking and shaking, particularly when you're near the groundwater table. You drill a hole just about anywhere, particularly in Boston, you're going to hit water, <coughs> right? You're going to hit water. And when water is close to the surface, you get a jello effect of shaking. It's called liquid faction after liquid. And that, you get more shaking. So areas that are near water with an earthquake have far more damage. It's like a dog shaking a rag. You're going to come down. That's what brings most of the destruction. It's the long shade. The buildings are pretty good at first, but gradually, gradually they're starting to get worn down. So if you have a station in San Francisco, it just knows it's somewhere there. You take a second station, Tokyo, you've got two, only two places it could be. You've gone, you've gone from an infinite number of places, now I know two places, one or the other, no, no other choice. At a third station, and you have the unique epicenter. So the epicenter is the position of the earthquake projected to the surface of the earth. There's also the focus, that's the epicenter, projected to the surface. The focus is actually where it is inside here. Because it may be shallow, but just as likely it's deep. The focus is the actual position inside the earth. The epicenter is where you put it on a map. That's the epicenter right there. How deep will you go? <laughs> so there it goes. There it goes. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Uh, I told you on Tuesday, Western U.S. is stretching already. Just like East Africa is extending today. And earthquakes that happen there are not on a plate boundary. This is not a plate boundary. Look at this. Stretching from Lake Tahoe down to the Salton Sea, or from the Great Salt Lake down to Taos, New Mexico, all of this. It's called the Great Basin. Look at the corrugated mountains. It is stretching, and the mountains are being pulled apart. All right? And it has earthquakes that are not on a plate boundary. These are called intraplate earthquakes. What you felt in August, how many of you felt Virginia's earthquake? Yeah! <laughs> For how many of you was that your first time? Yeah! <laughs> that was intraplate, all right? Intraplate earthquakes travel further because the ground is solid, not broken by faults, okay? Earthquakes travel a lot. That's why all the way up here, wherever you were, you felt that earthquake. And last time Salt Lake City, for example, had an earthquake was 1857, same for LA, and it's been a long time. So it's waiting. It's going to have another big one. Intraplate. That's another active area. It's down in New Madrid, Missouri. This area of Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, and Illinois, and it is rocking. It's an old fault. I told you the Earth's crust is already under great stress, and this one takes up lots of earthquakes. Uh, also, great, other great big ones, Charleston, New York City, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, these are huge. So we may get one here. We may get those arms coming down during this semester. All right? When the New Madrid earthquake happened in 1812, it caused the Mississippi River to flow north, and boats went cascading into the swamps. Crazy, crazy. So here's the New Madrid. Here's the basin the range. Those are all interplate. But where's the plate boundary? <coughs> Pretty well marked, isn't it? All right? So here's the subduction zone underneath Mexico and Central America. Here comes the East Pacific rise. Here's the San Andreas Fault. And here is subduction zones off the Cascades, and there are the Aleutians. But look at that. 
a gap in seismic activity. Seattle, Portland, get out of there. So we can't predict exactly when earthquakes are going to happen, but we can predict probability. How often it goes, and then when it hasn't happened. The Earth is absolutely earthquake constipated in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Has it gone? Have you ever had that condition? <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> and then, so when the Earth gets constipated, and then let go, how big was it? <laughs> well, six centimeters per year is average. Let's wait 200 years. Can you imagine not going for 200 years? And you build up six centimeters times 200. There it is. And 400 it multiplies out to four meters. That's 12 feet of offset. You just gave way 12 feet, wow, of earth movement. So that's how much an earthquake can happen on a fault that's not moving very often and not moving very far. That's a lot of movement. Is that going to bring down your building? Yeah. And when you look at the long-term history, you take 30 million years, not 200, and multiply it out, you're going to move 352 miles. So a town like L.A. is sitting up by Berkeley now. Crazy. That's what the Earth is doing. Always moving, all the time. Uh, we use a log scale to measure earthquakes for their magnitude. We used to use the Richter scale. We now use the moment magnitude scale. But they are in a power of 10. The energy is a power of 32. So they both work. The magnitude is how much wave function there is. How big <coughs> are the waves? And the difference between a, a 2 and a 4 is 100 times, 10 to the 2. The difference between a 2 and a 5 is 10 to the 3. That's a thousand times greater. So if we have a five earthquake, you're going to feel it. But an eight earthquake is how many times bigger than a five? A thousand times more magnitude. And 32 to 3, 33,000 times more. So it's a log scale, okay? Log scale. And you will have an exam question about a two or a five or a six or an eight. Okay? Can you can get that on the magnitude, not the energy. On the magnitude. All right, so there we go. Oh, God, there it is. Boom, one event. Look at that. Southern California Earthquake Center modeling on the Newport Inglewood Fault. And I will talk a lot about the West Coast today because you're going there. A lot of you are somewhere like it, and it's a good model. <laughs> it's, our last big ones are here. A big one is 8.0 or greater. We just saw Japan have been an 8.9. Can't imagine. And a 9 is 10 times bigger than an 8. I told you I was going to scare you. <laughs> and now we're waiting. Now, we've had smaller earthquakes. The San Fernando earthquake in 1971 was a 6.4. Is that a big one? <coughs> Do this. No. But it was pretty big. <laughs> it knocked down freeways. It knocked down buildings. I moved to L.A. in 1975. Never been there before. California. For a job interview. It's stuck. And so I came there as an earth virgin, right? Never felt the earth move. And then right away, we started having earthquakes. And they were little. And they were kind of fun. And that house would rock around. Hey, good. Yeah, that was cool. Kind of wobble wobble. And then, because the last time we had a pretty big one was 1971. I got there in 75. And then, in 1987, the Whittier earthquake broke. <coughs> it broke. We had glasses flying off of counters. Uh, dishes rattling, whole building was shaking, the kids were just outside heading to school. I ran outside and they were frogging, it was a blast. Birds coming out of the trees, dust rising from the ground. Scared the ass out of them. All right, first time I'd ever been scared. I did more, and that was only a 6.1. So sixes, sixes are dangerous. They're not the big ones. And then Southern California went into a whole series and Northern California of pretty big earthquakes. The Loma Prieto earthquake happened during the what game? World Series. Yeah, World Series. Who was playing it? That's pretty good. <laughs> so on land, you get landslides, you get liquefaction, you get uplift, and you get subsidence. The topography of the earth changes. At sea, so that's liquefaction created by the Loma Prieto earthquake. It was actually down near Santa Cruz where the epicenter was, but San Francisco's down low near the water. So 
So they have a whole lot of liquefaction. And you don't now know what liquefaction is, right? Yeah, all right. But out at the sea, the earth rupture is on the sea floor.